I'm Marie Harvey and welcome. Um, I'm the Associate Dean for Research here in the College of Public Health and Human Sciences at Oregon State University. And I'm delighted that you're joining the seminar today. Dr. Susan Gibbs, Susanna Gibbs, who is a postdoctoral fellow in the College of Public Health and Human Science. And she's also a very active member and contributor to our Sexual and Reproductive Health Equity Consortium has graciously agreed to introduce our speaker today and to moderate the session. Um, she'll provide more uh, details about the format of the seminar. So let's get started and please join me in welcoming Dr. Gibbs. Thanks, Marie. Uh, welcome everyone to the Friday Research Seminar. We're so glad you're able to join us for the CPHHS research presentation via Zoom. Uh, you probably mostly know the routine by now, but we've muted all of your microphones. To ask questions, please use the Q&A feature in Zoom, and we'll moder be moderating and repeating those questions for our guests today. So now let me go ahead and introduce our speaker. Diana Green Foster is a demographer who uses quantitative models and analyses to evaluate the effectiveness of family planning policies and the effects of unintended pregnancies. She's the professor at the University of California, San Francisco, and, a, and the director of research at the UCSF ANSWER program. She led the Turnaway Study, a national longitudinal perspective study of the health and well being of women who seek abortion in the United States, including both women who do and do not receive the abortion. She is currently collaborating with scientists on a Turnaway study in Nepal. Dr. Foster received her undergraduate degree from UC Berkeley, her MA and PhD in demography and public policy from Princeton University. She is the author of the 2020 book, The Turnaway Study, 10 Years, 1,000 Women, and the Consequences of Having or Being Denied an Abortion. It is my great pleasure to virtually welcome Diana Green Foster to OSU and to present her work at this week's college seminar. Thank you so much, Dr. Gibbs, and thank you, Dr. Harvey. It's a pleasure to be here. I wish I were really here in person in Corvallis. Um, uh, I'm happy to to share with you the research findings from the Turnaway study, um, and that will be the topic of my talk today. So I'm going to talk about the consequences of receiving versus being denied a wanted abortion in the United States. Um, this, uh, the question, does abortion hurt women, is a concept, an idea that has resonated in our political debates. It, uh, it's on billboards in the Bay Area, maybe it's on billboards where you are, and it's um, an idea that women would come to regret their decision to have an abortion and be, have mental health problems. And this idea has resonated so much that even uh, the Supreme Court took this on. And so in one decision in 2007, Anthony Kennedy, who was on the court then, um, said that though he couldn't find any reliable data, he thought it was reasonable to think that women would, would have regret and be depressed. And so, it was high time in 2007 to, to provide some reasonable, some reliable data. And that was really the goal of the Turnaway study. It's to look at the mental health, physical health, and socioeconomic consequences of receiving an abortion compared to the only other option open to a woman who um, has a pregnancy that, that she doesn't wanna to carry to term, which is to carry that pregnancy to term. So lots of the research that had been done around abortion had either not had any comparison group, just women who have abortions, and then you don't know, well, was, is, uh, are there outcomes related to having the abortion or something about their outcomes that predispose them to wanting an abortion in the first place? And so, and it didn't tell you what the consequences would be if they hadn't gotten an abortion. So how did we do this study? We went to 30 abortion facilities across the United States. We chose these 30 sites because uh, if you were pregnant and wanted an abortion uh, and you went to one of these sites, there was no one, no other site within 150 miles that um, would do an abortion later in pregnancy. So if you were too late to get an abortion, um, you likely, we thought you would likely carry the pregnancy to term. And so we recruited from each of these sites, three types of women. Most of these sites had gestational limits in the second trimester, but 90% of American women or uh, who have abortions, Amer people who have abortions do so in the first trimester. So we recruited 
women who were just over the gestational limit and were denied an abortion, women who were just under the gestational limit and received it. But since most of those facilities had limits in the second trimester, what we wanted to know what were those women that I'll call near limit um, abortion group, did they have a typical experience? So for each site, we also recruited women in the first trimester. We followed all three groups over five years um, and we excluded women who um, were seeking abortion for fetal anomaly. And I have to say, we used the word women back in 2007 and eight when we started this, we wouldn't have done that now. But in fact, this is a study of people who identified as women um, and excludes the experience of trans men and for which I'm sorry. Um, but uh, I can't go back and, and get them into the study. So I'm gonna use the word women, even though there are people who are not women who also seek abortion care. So we recruited just under a thousand women um, between 2008 and 2010. We followed all of them as best we could for five years, calling them every six months for telephone interviews in either English or Spanish. Um, and the whole concept of the, the study design is that the turnaway group and the near limit group we were hoping would be extremely similar so that um, the, their differences over time would be due to whether they received an abortion or not. And um, because we were using narrow bands around the gestational limits of each facility and facilities had a varying gestational limits, you could be denied an abortion at one site at the same gestation you would have received it had you been several hundred miles away at a different site. So, um, but the study design wasn't quite perfect in that the leading reason people show up late um, to get an abortion is that they didn't realize they were pregnant. And although there isn't a lot of science on this who discovers they're pregnant late, it seems to be higher incidence than triplets of people discovering very late that they're pregnant. Um, and um, who's particularly at risk of late discovery is uh, people who've never been pregnant before. And so you'll see the turnaway group is slightly younger than the women in the near limit group. Um, and all of our analyses adjust for this difference. Um, no differences in by race, ethnicity and study group and they were um, uh, represent the demographics of women who seek abortion nationally. So I'm going to get in, it's, this was a product of a, a large group of scientists, and so I'm going to show you their pictures and a few of their articles, and, um, uh, and you can access some of these articles on the website turnawaystudy.com. So my colleague Antonia Biggs, who's a social psychologist, has published m most of the papers she's led on the mental health consequences, so let's look at those data. Uh, and I'm going to go very fast because I'm trying to cover a lot of material. So if you want it done in justice, I'm afraid you probably have to find the paper. But what we measured were depression symptoms and cases, anxiety symptoms and cases, life satisfaction, self-esteem, and suicidal ideation and post-traumatic stress. And to, um, to, in one slide, tell you what we found. Uh, the women who were, we, who were denied an abortion actually had higher anxiety and lower self-esteem than the women who received an abortion. So to the extent that abortion seeking hurt, hurts women, it's women who are denied the abortion have worse outcomes than women who receive them. But the two groups converged by six to 12 months. Um, and you could say, oh, the two groups are the same because uh, both groups are doing so terribly because having an abortion is terrible and, and having a uh, giving birth to an unwanted pregnancy is also terrible, but that is not the case. In fact, both women in both groups improved over all outcomes over time. So symptoms in cases of depression, suicidal ideation, post-traumatic stress, and life satisfaction both didn't differ by study group and also improved over time. 
So denying women an abortion is more harmful than allowing her to get a wanted procedure in terms of mental health and the many policies that mandate that women be counseled on the mental health risks of abortion are not based in evidence. So it's one thing to say, okay, abortion doesn't cause pathology, but that doesn't mean that women, some mental health pathology, but that doesn't mean people don't have an emotional response to having had an abortion. So just because you're not depressed doesn't mean you're not sad um, or might mean you're actually happy. So my colleague, uh, the epidemiologist, Corinne Raka, led papers about uh, how women felt emotionally. So we asked them, this is just one week after obtaining an abortion. We asked them about um, uh, six emotions, uh, happiness, sadness, regret, relief, and guilt. That might not have been six. And we grouped them, the people that said predominantly, I'm feeling the positive emotions. No, predominantly I'm feeling the negative emotions. The mixed is people who felt both the negative and positive. And low is people who say, I'm really not feeling any of that. So they're, they're having a low emotional response. So here, just color coded, these are people who received an abortion. You can see that positive outweigh emotion, uh, negative, but in fact, negative having negative emotions, a quarter of them uh, or, or plus 18%. So that's almost half of women actually have some negative emotions about the abortion, but many of them also have positive emotions because it's complicated. And if we look um, at the question, was abortion the right decision for you? 95% um, of people said, yes, it was the right decision for me. And among people who said, I have predominantly a negative emotional response. So the emotions I'm feeling are mostly negative. 90% of those people said that abortion was the right decision. Among the people who it specifically expressed the emotion regret, 93% said it was the right decision. So I think that there's a separation of allowing people to have an emotional response to something that can be a big event and actually feeling that abortion was not the right decision for them. This is over time, emotions, the blue again is positive, the yellow is negative and the darker gray is both negative and positive. You can see both negative and positive emotions decrease over time. Um, positive emotions remain more common, but the biggest change over time is people stopping thinking about their abortion. And that's what people said to us. The only time I think about it is when you call me for these interviews. Now this is um, the, uh, over five years, the proportion who say that it's, that abortion was the right decision. And the biggest predictor we found of any variation on this, and it's hard because most women say it was the right decision, is how difficult they said making the decision was at the very first interview. So people who said it was very difficult to make the decision were lagged behind the others in saying that it was the right decision and yet still extremely high endorsement of that decision. This next slide is among people who received who did not receive the abortion, who carried the pregnancy to term. And you can see at one week, 65% of them still wish they could have had an abortion. Um, and at six months they've delivered and only 12% say they wish they could have had an abortion down to about 4% at five years. So it's somewhat similar, maybe a little higher than the um, wishing you could had not had the abortion among the people who received it. But similar, still, people are resilient in, and feel that their life, as it turned out, was for the best. Um, fewer than 10% of the women turned away actually decided to place the child for adoption. And those who did place the child for adoption were more likely to say they still wish they could have had the abortion. Next, moving to physical health outcomes. These are epidemiologists Lauren Ralph and Caitlin Gertz. Um, who have published on these data. Looking at the immediate health consequences from the end of pregnancy, um, we find that um, this is consistent with the medical literature that um, giving birth is a much more significant risk than having an abortion, even a later abortion. Um, and you can see this in terms of uh, days of limited activity. 
you don't see it in the percentage of people who report a complication, but the complications they report are much more likely to be life-threatening complications if they've had a delivery than if they've had an abortion. This is from Dr. Ralph's uh, paper in the Annals of Internal Medicine, and it shows that not just the end of pregnancy, which was that previous slide, but over the five years, women who gave birth are more likely to report fair or poor health over time than women who received an abortion. So this is both a product of the risks of pregnancy and gestational hypertension, for example, but also um, that the stress of parenting a child that you weren't ready to um, parent may also contribute to a sense of worse physical health. Um, we, at the end of the study, we uh, looked at the women who had enrolled in the study and found eight deaths, um, four of them among people who were denied abortions, four who were um, in that near limit group, and two of the four maternal deaths were maternal deaths. So these were people who died because they gave birth. Um, it was the risk of ongoing pregnancy. One was an infection, one was a very common severe complication. This is an astronomical death rate for um, delivery and uh, the most surprising and, and sad finding of the study. So to um, conclude on the physical health findings, um, women who were denied an abortion and went on to give birth were more likely to experience, and I didn't show you all these outcomes, but just as gestational hypertension, joint uh, pain and headaches, fair and poor health over the five years. There were no differences in the outcomes for women who had a first trimester versus a second trimester abortion. And the deaths due to maternal causes were much more common than we would have expected. It's less than two in 10,000 in the United States, 10,000 births, but two in about 200 for this study. So a shocking level of maternal mortality. I'm going on to the socioeconomic consequences. We published this in the American Journal of Public Health. So this is um, the green is women who were denied and gave birth. The blue or black is people who were just under the gestational limit. And when I've shaded it, it's because the differences are no longer statistically significant. So one week after being denied an abortion, there's already an employment gap. And that gap is maintained through four years. So if you uh, carry the pregnancy to term and give birth, you're less likely to be full-time employed. No differences in welfare at the very first observation, but over time, women who give birth are much more likely to receive welfare. Um, the, um, one second, the welfare you see, it's decreasing over time. In part, that's because there are, it's not necessarily that they no longer needed welfare, but people can time out of welfare. Food stamps, on the other hand, you don't time out of and there aren't conditions for how long after a birth you can receive them. And so um, you can see that the, the gap in need is significant and maintained through the five years of the study. There's more economic hardship among the people who give birth, even though there was no significant difference at onset. And this is the graph for the household falling below the federal poverty level. You can see that women who gave birth were turned away and gave birth, were more likely to live below the federal poverty level than women who um, received an abortion just under the limit. Um, this is not a uh, reporting that they don't have enough money to pay for basic living needs. You can see these are also significant through the five years. So big differences in economic trajectories where women who are denied abortions face more hardships and Public assistance mitigates the loss of full-time employment, but not nearly enough to keep uh, women who are raising children from falling below the federal poverty level. Um, and I didn't show it to you, but um, women who are denied an abortion are much more likely to be raising that child alone than raising it with extended family or with the man involved in the pregnancy or a male partner of any sort. Um, I somehow missed a slide to tell you the reasons why people um, had abortions, but one of the leading reasons that people have abortions, the, the most common is the one we just talked about of um, 
feeling like you can't afford to have a child or to have another child, another major reason is to take care of children they already have. So 60% of women who have abortions nationally are already mothers, same in the Turnaway study. So what happens? Are they right to be concerned about their existing children? Um, oops, I just said that. Um, many women give their desire to care for their existing kids as a reason for terminating the pregnancy. So we measured a whole bunch of outcomes. We did not find differences. It, these are the existing children at the time the woman became pregnant and sought an abortion. No difference in injuries, no difference in whether she, they're living with their mother, uh, who takes care of them or asthma, but large differences in poverty. So if the mom is denied an abortion, the child is much more likely to live in a household that falls below the federal poverty level and live in a household where there's not enough money for basic living needs. And we also asked for all kids, existing children, children born when the mom was denied an abortion and subsequent children born over the five years, we asked about whether the kid achieves basic um, developmental milestones. So these are gross motor, you can read them on the bottom, expressive language, fine motor, gross motor, receptive language, self-help and social emotional. And we, so this, this graph compares the existing children to women who receive an abortion and the, to the existing children um, of women who are denied an abortion. And on every one of these measures, if your mother received an abortion, you do better than if your mom is denied an abortion. Overall, it's not statistically, sorry, individually, they're not statistically significant, but they follow a, a pattern. But um, in terms of uh, the, the, the scale, taking all of these into cons together, um, they have, you have a 4% lower chance of, of achieving these developmental milestones if your mother received one in abortion compared to was denied one. Um, so then there's another set of children involved uh, that are interesting to look at. This um, looks at the well-being of children born from that pregnancy where the woman was denied an abortion to the um, to a child born to a woman who received an abortion as part of the study, but went on to have a pregnancy carried to term within the five years. So is there an actual benefit to the child born if the mom is able to wait to have a baby? Um, this is a measure of pregnancy intendedness. So this is whether the pregnancy was planned in advance. It's the London measure. And as you move from zero, those are not planned in advance and 12 is extremely planned in advance. These are behaviors that the woman does or conversations the woman has with her partner or, or desire for a pregnancy. Um, and um, you can see the green are the child born from a where abortion was denied. The blue is a next child born to a woman who received their abortion. And you can see the next child born is much more likely to have been planned in advance. Um, um, not all of these clearly were planned in advance and for 21% of those subsequent children, the woman still considered an abortion but opted not to have one. So she chose to um, give birth. We looked at how the woman felt about the child um, using a British scale, the postpartum bonding questionnaire and found that when the index child is a child born after abortion denial compared to a subsequent child that's subsequent to an abortion. So the woman had an abortion, had another child within five years. The child born after abortion denial, from abortion denial, have worse postpartum, uh, postpartum bonding with their moms, higher odds of poor bonding, and consistently across all the 12 items have worse bonding, um, including um, these are individually significant, but it's just for you to see the kind of items that are in these scales my baby stresses me out, I feel trapped as a mother, or I resent my baby. Um, when we look at the children's health, index children are more likely to have an injury in the past six months, but no differences in physical disabilities, asthma, or breastfeeding. Um, socioeconomic outcomes, the index child is more likely to be raised um, in lower poverty households, and we're in households where there's not enough money to meet basic living needs. So when the woman is able to wait to have a baby, she is more likely to raise her child in a 
household that has enough money for basic living needs. Um, and index children are also less likely to be raised in a household with a male adult. And no difference in public assistance between those two sets of children. So all the differences, maternal bonding, injuries, socioeconomics, show that the, the index child, the child born because the mom was denied an abortion is worse off than the child born to a woman who received an abortion and chose to give birth within the five years. So in normal person language, access to abortion enables women to have children at a time when they have both the financial and emotional resources to denote, devote to their children. A few quotes from women in the study about this. Um, a woman who was denied an abortion in California said, I wish I had her when I was much, when I was older, more stable, more financially set, just pretty much to where I knew who I was because it was like raising her and trying to figure me out. And a 26 year old woman denied an abortion in Illinois said, the timing was way off, but that's okay. Everything happens for a reason and it is what it is. And we got through it and it wasn't perfect timing, but most things in life aren't. You just learn to deal with it and you move on. Um, and you can contrast this with a woman who received her abortion but had a child within the five years. And she said, it, pro it would have been probably the worst thing for that child to come into this world because it would have never had the support it needed. I wasn't mentally stable for that child. I do have a one-year-old now and I'm able to support myself, able to support my kids and know the timing is right. Uh, so other um, life um, opportunities, this is not doing justice to these papers, um, but my colleague uh, Ushma Upadhyay um, has published a paper um, looking at the chance of having an intended pregnancy within the five years, and women who received their abortion had a higher rate of intended pregnancies than women who were denied an abortion and gave birth. And then the nursing uh, doctoral student, um, Angel Azatlan James, published a paper looking at uh, unintended pregnancies and found the same rate of unintended pregnancies in the two groups. Um, and then um, my colleague, uh, uh, Ushma Padiai, we have in uh, under review a paper that looks at the quality of women's romantic relationships. So this is romantic relationships uh, with men or women over the five years. And I didn't, when I designed this study, I kept, we had questions in there about the relationships with the man involved in the pregnancy. And um, we published papers that aren't listed here, but you can find them on the website that showed that um, consistent with what women say, they say, um, my relationship isn't good enough to have a baby. And that's one of their reasons for abortion. And we find their, rom their romantic relationships with the man involved in the pregnancy dissolve regardless of whether they get their abortion or not. Not all of them, but there's a slow, a steady decrease in the chance that you're still with the man involved in the pregnancy. Um, and so we were asking questions about that. And, and my colleague, Sarah Roberts, published paper a paper about uh, exposure to intimate partner violence that showed that women who um, were denied the abortion they weren't in a romantic relationship with the man involved, but they were had continuing contact with him because they had a baby. And that continuing contact meant that they had no decrease in exposure to violence where the women who received an abortion did have a decrease. Um, so um, Ushma then pointed out that I didn't have questions about her, the women's romantic relationships with other people, not the man involved in the pregnancy. So only partway through the study, we added a question about their quality of their, whether they're in a romantic relationship at all and the quality of that relationship. And um, uh, Dr. Upadhyay is currently going to publish a study which shows that there's no difference in whether they're in a relationship, but women who are received an abortion are more likely to call their relationship a uh, very high quality. So um, it's it, and even a pretty sizable difference, 47% versus 28% at two years say their, they, their romantic relationship is very good. So conclusions. I, I think I sped through and now I'm wishing I had gone slower. <laughs> uh, 
Um, the Turnaway study shows uh, is a chance to look at the effect of having access to abortion services on women's physical and mental health, the well being of their families, and the trajectory of their lives. I think the debate about abortion is so focused on a moral question or an abstract political question that we don't understand the full scope of how many people's lives are affected and how large and long lasting the effect is. So it's, it's a very major um, physical health risk to carry a pregnancy to term and it has lasting effects on people's lives. Um, we find that abortion neither helps nor harms women's mental health in the long run. In the short run, women who are denied abortions fare worse in terms of anxiety and loss of self-esteem. In the long run, women are emotionally resilient. We do find benefits that the women who received an abortion actually do better in several areas compared to carrying an unwanted pregnancy to term, um, improve physical health, financial security, I didn't show you the data, but aspirational plans and the ability to take care of both their existing children and their chance at having intended future children. Um, and all of the negative consequences that we observe are directly related to the reasons women gave for wanting to have an abortion. So it really um, uh, shows you that women are making decisions that are thoughtful. They understand the consequences of having a baby on their lives. Many of them already have babies, but having another baby on their lives. And when they are making that decision, they understand the consequences. And we see those negative consequences in the experiences of people who are denied abortions and carry the pregnancy to term. I um, just in June, while we were all in lockdown and hiding in our homes, published my first book. So this has been the weirdest book tour where I can wear cargo shorts and slippers along with a fancy top to um, give book tour talks. Um, and so this book was published by Scribner, which is an imprint of Simon and Schuster. And it um, describes the context of the study so that why one would need to study the consequences of abortion, as well as the major scientific findings, but entirely told in a lay, uh, for a lay audience, along with the stories of 10 women from the study. So when we were done all of the quantitative data collection, we interviewed 31 women to tell their stories of what happened to them and how they were feeling in their own words. And you saw some quotes from that in this little presentation. And um, we, I picked of those 31, 10 of them to just, all I did was take out their ums and likes and uh, order their story chronologically, but it's their story and their words. And it, these stories intersperse the chapters that discuss the science. Um, so you can get this book on Amazon or uh, at bookshop.org. And if you do get it, I'd love to hear what you think. And also, if you get it and like it, I'd love it if you wrote a, um, a review on Amazon or anywhere or on Goodreads. Um, I want to acknowledge the support of the funders, um, private foundations and um, uh, um, and uh, an IAAA uh, grant to my colleague Sarah Roberts to look at the alcohol and drug findings. Um, thanks to the abortion facilities who identified eligible women and to the women who took their time to share their experiences with our team. Um, this was a, a not a one woman study. This was a, a collaboration of a huge group of people. Um, so I thank the study team. These are people who did the interviews and arranged the sites and um, built the data sets and um, dealt with IRB kind of issues. Um, and the um, investigators who actually led papers, there were more than this who led papers, but these, these were the main people who wrote papers based on the data and their um, disciplines. If you have um, questions or comments, please feel free to ask them in the question and answer or to um, email me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Fester, for that thought-provoking presentation. Um, so 
Those of you in the audience, please go ahead and um, take some time to type in your questions. It looks like we already have one question. So yeah, I can see it. In fact, oh, okay. I it. Well, I'll read free. it. So that Suzanne, everyone, yeah, please. Everyone can hear it. So the question is, what are some of the potential explanations for the higher rate of maternal mortality among the women in the study? Were these women seeking abortions because they had a high risk pregnancy? Um, that's an excellent question. And we actually excluded, in addition to excluding people who had abortions for reasons of fetal anomaly, we also um, excluded people who were having an abortion because they explicitly had a um, imminent physical health reason for doing so. So there's no one whose life was at risk because if they, if we had recruited people um, who had an imminent risk of death from this study, they would never have ended up in the turnaway group. They would have, there would have, exceptions would have been made and they would have received their abortion. And our whole goal in recruitment was to have women who received and denied the abortions to be as similar as possible. So the study excluded women who had imminent physical health risks. That said, pregnancy is risky and one doesn't always know, you know, it's the problem if at the point you seek an abortion, you may not realize that that um, pregnancy carried to term might be so risky because one cannot always predict the physical health risks of pregnancy. So um, I think that um, although they didn't pick an abortion because they, it was not common to decide to have an abortion for health reasons, I, um, it, um, pregnancy is risky. And these women probably disproportionately had low social support. Um, people who had a lot of social support are more likely to pick to carry a pregnancy to term. And I think, um, and they're economically disadvantaged as well. So I think it's a, a whole confluence of risk factors and also just terrible luck. I think it's also, a, it reflects a higher risk of pregnancy, but even with that, I would never have expected two maternal deaths in this study. So I think it's also just terrible luck and not um, a sign that anyone denied an abortion is gonna die. Thanks, so we have another question. What role does comprehensive sex education play in your study? That's a stumper. We didn't ask people what kind of sex ed they'd gotten. Um, but, uh, and I'm just gonna, I can't ask the person who's anonymous what they, what they were thinking, but I'm gonna project what I would be thinking if I wrote that question, is that what are, is to think that, you know, that women must not have understood, must not have had good sex ed if they became pregnant when they didn't want to be, or, that they didn't, or they must have had bad sex ed if they didn't realize they were pregnant until uh, the second trimester. And maybe that's what they're thinking. And if that's what they're thinking, I can say, um, it doesn't take bad sex ed to um, have unprotected sex or to have a contraceptive failure. So access to contraception is surprisingly difficult. Many women don't like the methods that are out there, even if you like a method, having consistent access to a contraceptive method for the 30 something years you need to prevent pregnancy in order to entirely plan your families is very difficult. And it's, you know, um, many couples, I've done studies outside of Turnaway, many couples sometimes have unprotected sex. And that's because the risk of, if you had comprehensive sex ed, you would be, and you, and they never include this, your chance of conceiving at any given act of intercourse is very low. The hassle involved in contracepting can be high. So when you're balancing those, it's not totally crazy to have unprotected sex, and people do, and the side effects from contraception are real. And so this happens, and most of the time people don't become pregnant. So um, you know, it's not the case that people only have sex when they want to get pregnant. And it's not the case that, um, you know, people are perfect contraceptors. And most people are in between of um, trying their best and not doing a perfect job. 
I saw some terrible Facebook thing, you know, with a bunch of pictures of people using, wearing their face masks like this, you know, with their nose showing, which says that they understand why uh, barrier contraceptive methods fail, you know, as people not using their masks, right? But it's it, it, it's easy to, to laugh at, but it's just actually quite difficult for 30 years of risk of pregnancy from the time you start having sex to menopause to do things perfectly. And I feel like it's not just a lack of knowledge, it's that we make things as difficult as possible to be a good contraceptive user or consistent one. Um, and we don't have methods that meet everybody's needs. Uh, and then, sorry, I, I really stretched this. Give me an ambiguous question and I can really stretch it out. Um, other is not realizing you're pregnant. So I don't think most sex ed classes cover all the symptoms of pregnancy. But even if they did, it wouldn't do it because some people don't have pregnancy symptoms and they're super lucky for the people who you know, wanna be pregnant to go through first trimester and never be tired and nauseated is like a dream come true. If you don't think that you could become pregnant, then not having those symptoms can easily result in you not realizing. Um, Lots of people spot during the first trimester. You can think that's a period. Lots of people don't have regular periods anyway, especially young women. Um, and so it's just, it's, it, it happens. And I think it's much more about physiology. Uh, sometimes also a lot of the people who didn't realize they were pregnant had just had a baby. So your body is in total turmoil because you just had a baby. So not surprising that you're not realizing that you feel like crap. And it's not because you're, you know, you're trying to care for a newborn. It's because you're actually pregnant again. So people, there are lots of reasons. And I think that it can be a matter of knowledge and sex ed maybe could help, but really it's probably not mostly about that. It's not that people are stupid. It's that they're doing the best they can. And and pregnancies just don't go according to textbook where, you know, a, it's not like in the movies where you know the female character is pregnant because she throws up, you know, it just doesn't reliably happen that way. How was that? Anonymous can tell us if that wasn't what they meant. We got a great answer, thank you. So, <laughs> uh, so next question we have. Aside from distance to abortion clinic, what other systems level factors such as systemic racism, political conservatism, other oppressive legislation, such as the Hyde Amendment, to mention a few, were taken into account in the study? That's an awesome question. Um, I don't know how if everyone knows all of those things, and I won't do, be able to do justice to all those topics either. Um, narrowing in on the abortion specific one, the Hyde Amendment is since I think sometime in the 70s maybe, um, Henry Hyde was a representative who um, he wanted to ban all abortions but knew he couldn't ban uh, wealthy women from getting them and so he used a funding bill to ban uh, anyone who had federal insurance from using their health insurance to pay for abortion. So that's all federal employees, Peace Corps, military, and everyone who's on Medicaid, which is a humongous number of people. And the Hyde Amendment means that all of those people can't use their health insurance to cover abortion. In addition to that, there's, um, there are states that pass laws that say you can't use your private insurance to pay for abortion. So it's not even like taxpayers don't want their money paying for abortion. You can't use your own private health insurance. So there's there is you know active legislation that tries to make women pay the price of becoming pregnant when they don't want to be, and making sure that they have to pay. Um, and as a result, there have been a few studies um, that show that, and both of or the few studies I know about, all actually come up with around the, the same estimate of about a quarter of people who are poor and can't pay for their abortion instead, um, wait, who, poor people who affected by the Hyde Amendment carried the pregnancy to term instead of having an abortion where they would have an abortion if it were covered. So um, these, these restrictions, when everyone says you can't ban abortion, 
Um, actually, you can. You can stop people from having abortions by making it too expensive to pay for an abortion. The question went away and there were other um, ones I'm gonna click to see. I mean, racism and uh, political conservatism are really important and hard to measure. And I didn't, I didn't have measures of those. But on conservatism, we had measures of stigma and how much people close to the woman would look down on her if they'd known she sought an abortion to see how that affected her well-being. And it was exposure to abortion stigma or um, lack of support by people close to you or people in your community was associated with worse mental health, but um, I didn't measure racism. And I did look to see whether outcomes differed by race ethnicity and didn't find them. There were a few areas in which um, Latinas seem to have worse emotional reactions. Um, African-American women reported lower stigma around abortion, but none of this explains um, none of this does justice to the concept of um, systemic racism. And I think our complete lack of sympathy for people who are pregnant when they don't want to be is actually partly a product of systemic racism, is the assumption that they're poor people, they're people of color, and so we don't care, I guess, what happens to them, not we, but I think this is the thinking that is racist. Um, and there, when I started this study, I did get some people who said, you're studying women having later abortions. Their lives are a mess. If, they, if their lives weren't a mess, they wouldn't be seeking a later abortion. That turns out not to be true. They were exactly the same as the first trimester on most measures. Uh, but their lives are a mess. So whether they get an abortion or they have a birth, they're probably doomed. You know, they're, It won't really matter. You're not gonna find big outcomes. And those people were completely wrong. When we look at what the women wanted to achieve in their lives over the next five years, when they were denied an abortion, they dramatically scaled back their aspirational plans around education, around employment, about um, you know, moving to their own place, about um, graduating from school, about uh, finding better jobs. And when they, they were less likely to set an aspirational plan and achieve it if they were denied an abortion than if they received it. And so there is a trajectory and uh, even people who you think their life is chaotic have great potential when they're able to make their own decisions about their lives. So one question from me, I was hoping you could talk a little bit more about your experiences disseminating and publicizing your study findings particularly if you have any advice for researchers and particularly grad students who might be listening and early career researchers for talking to the media and communicating research findings? That's a good question. Um, it's been completely nuts because I'm trying to disseminate a book during a pandemic. And I think it's correct that our, our national conversation is about racism and um, and now it's largely about the election. And it's like the first time in American history when the thing everyone's talking about isn't abortion. <laughs> so um, those other things need to be talked about too. And I'm not complaining. And sadly with this new Supreme Court um, appointee or will be appoint yeah, appointee, um, we're likely to talk about abortion in the future. So um, it's been a really weird time to disseminate a book. Um, uh, I do have that turnawaystudy.com is clearly such a new website. I didn't even have it on my slides, but if you're teaching a course on abortion or reproductive health, um, that website has a tab called the course and in it, uh, like 10 of my colleagues and I have put lectures on different topics. So who gets later abortions? Um, what are the physical health consequences? What are the educational consequences? There's a whole series of lectures there. So it's a resource if anyone would like them and nothing like you know being stuck at home and, and trying to disseminate into a world that you can't venture into that I am very eager for feedback. So if you check those things out and like them, please tell me. And um, even if you don't like them, please tell me. Um, yeah, and in terms of talking to the media, it's really good to get training on that. 
And even though I've had training, I'm not good at following the training I get. Like they want you really to stick, to have your messages laid out and stick to them. But I always, you know, it's these great journalists and I want to be best friends. So I'm never the model for, you know, I want to chat and not stick to message and tell them something I think is interesting that is not what anyone else is thinking about and so probably shouldn't be mentioned. So I'm not a good model. And so you should definitely model after someone else. That said, people, you know, when you're not super restricted and they don't feel like you're feeding them um, approved messages or there's a word for that, but I forget what it is. Um, I've, they've been very nice to me in terms of not quoting the silliest things I've said, but trying to, um, you know, I, I've had really amazing media coverage. I was on Fresh Air with Terry Gross on February, no, on June 16th. And that, um, I talked to her for two hours and it was exhausting. And I am sure I said things that weren't that great, but they spliced two hours down to one. And so I sound like every single question I nailed. But it's, you just know that there are twice as many out there that where I was probably not, where I stuttered and whatever. So, um, and she also asked me about my grandmother. So in the book, I talk about my own personal family history. I don't have any abortion stories of my own, but I have one grandmother who had an illegal abortion during the depression and another grandmother who pregnant with my mom when she was 19, uh, placed my mom for adoption. And, um, and so, so she asked about that and I ended up like people that was their favorite part of the interview. So I do this whole study about pe what people actually want to hear about our personal stories. So good thing that my grandmother produced, grandmothers produced them, but it wasn't, I am never in any other or almost no other radio spots has, has that come up because it's not natural for me to, um, to bring them up. I want to I think, talk. I think Terry does her background yes. research well. <laughs> so I think oh, we actually have a couple more questions. Um, so someone says, thank you for this important and impressive study. It sounds like the stigma around abortion rather than the procedure itself can contribute to negative mental health outcomes. What are some of the ways we can combat that stigma? That's a really great question. Um, I think, I think that, so this is outside of what I learned from my study, because I didn't ask, there was no way I could ask this question. And there are people who, um, I would say that the part of the stigma about abortion is because we don't hear from, we often don't hear from people who actually have abortions. And even the people that are in our own family who have abortions or our close friends, there have been studies that show that people don't share their abortion stories with people they know are opposed to abortion. Okay, that's not a shocker, right? But it results in people who are opposed to abortion never hearing from the people who are affected. And in the book, I quote um, this amazing Al Jazeera interview with um, a guy whose name is B-U-C-H-Y, and I think I always mispronounce it, but maybe his name is Bucky, but he's an Ohio State representative. He's the author of like every restriction in Ohio. And in this Al Jazeera clip, he, the, the reporter asks him, so why do women get abortions? And he's completely flummoxed. He has <laughs> he's like no answer. He's like chuckling. He's looking up to the sky. It's the most painful thing ever because he's never, and he says, you know, I don't, I'm not a woman. I've never thought about it but he's writing abortion restrictions because he has a viewpoint that's just not informed by real people. And so I think it is people who are active in abortion storytelling, I think it's super important. And maybe people automatically say, well, if you're the kind of person who shares your abortion story, somehow you're, you're not typical. So, or, and so there are a couple, so my book has stories of women who were on no political, um, 
you know, it's not their mission to share their stories. They were part of a study. And then there's another one, that, another book that just came out called um, You're the Only One I've Told. Can you see? Abortion, st the stories behind abortion by Dr. Mira Shaw, which is, um, in except for the first chapter, entirely stories of people. And I think it is partly to understand how common abortion is and also um, to hear what someone's thinking and to realize that people are making thoughtful, careful decisions. Um, so we have a question. Your brochures on the website are really nice really and really like the study summary. Did you have external publication support or did you budget that internally for the dissemination materials? Um, we put in the, in the, you know, publishing at my university is big and disseminating is big. Um, so I definitely am allowed to use my time to try and get the study results out. We didn't have that much outside like formatting of our materials or anything. If they look good, it's because people on staff at my university are good. I don't know. I didn't see the question, so I'm not sure I did it, but um. I think that was good. I think we only have a couple of minutes left, so I'm, I'm going to give you one last big question, and you, uh -oh. you can do with it what you like. So my question is, in this environment, you mentioned the Supreme Court, where science is not necessarily valued in political and policy decision making, particularly for abortion access. How, how do we use this research? How are you planning on using this research to protect or expand access to abortion services? Um, there was a case in 2016 called Whole Women's Health versus Hellerstead, which was a really beautiful case from a science perspective. It said Texas couldn't just pass restrictions they wanted. They had to base their restrictions, whether a restriction was constitutional or not, was based on whether the perceived benefits and costs of the burdens of the restriction that they couldn't just say, you know, make every provider scale a six foot wall one handed because that'll improve safety. You know, it had to, there had to be some reasonable, that was an onion article. It was really funny. Only it's like a 20 foot wall, but anyway, you know, they had to have a, uh, there had to be a scientific reason to think that this, that a restriction aimed at improving safety would actually improve safety. Um, and in that environment in 2016, um, you know, this study is super important because it's, it has the evidence. What are the harms if you're actually denied an abortion and you wanted one? In 2020, then at the end of June, end of June, the case June versus Russo came out and it um, said, and uh, John Roberts said, enough with the weighing, it's too complicated. Who's supposed to be, we can't do that. Um, and I don't remember what his rationale was for you know, supporting abortion access in Louisiana, but it wasn't that he was, had any interest in the weighing. And I was so sad because this is exactly where the turnaway study would have helped. But I don't know what the future is. Whole Women's Health versus Hellerstedt is still there and is how policy should be made. Um, actually weighing the science, paying attention to the effect of policy on people. So I live in hope, even if we're in slightly dark times. Thank you so much. Thank you for fielding all those questions and thank you for your wonderful presentation. Um, and thanks to everyone who joined us this week.